But let's pray as we come to God's word here today. Dear Lord, we just do want to thank you that you're such a great and awesome God. We thank you for what you did for us. We thank you that we owed a debt we couldn't pay, and you paid a price that you didn't know. We thank you that you came to this earth, that God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Father, we just want to thank you and praise you, and we thank you that your Holy Spirit is here. We welcome your Holy Spirit in this place, Lord. We pray that you would take these loaves and fishes that have been prepared, that you would bless them and break them and multiply them and make this time looking at the birth of Christ and the events that surrounded it rich and meaningful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, this morning, we're going to be talking about born a king. Born a king. I lived in England and Scotland for eight years, my wife and I, Charlene and I together, married for seven years. I lived there eight years all together for a year when, before we were married. And they have kings and queens in England. I've been to Bhutan where they have a king. And what I want to tell you is there's only one who was born a king. <laughs> you can be born a prince. You can be born a princess. But there's only one who could be born a king because a newborn is incapable of ruling. But when God himself has taken on our humanity and Christ was born fully God, although not accessing his privileges as God, fully man, he was born a king. He could rule at birth. He chose not to access his deity. But when the wise men came and said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? That's a whole different thing than Prince Charles or Prince Andrew or, you know, <laughs> that's a whole different thing. But we're going to be beginning here with Luke's gospel in chapter 2, beginning with verse 8 through 16. We're going to be reading and following this along. So Luke's gospel in chapter two, it says this. We're, we're backtracking a little bit back to the shepherds here, but in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born to you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly... There appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that which has happened that the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph, and the baby as he lay in the manger. You know, that whole thing with these shepherds out in the fields. The writer of Hebrews takes this up and quotes a quotation from the Old Testament. And when he, speaking of the Father, brings the firstborn. Last week we looked at one of the titles of Jesus as the firstborn. When he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and he quotes a prophecy from the Old Testament that is literally fulfilled in those fields of Bethlehem and let all the angels of God worship him. I mean, every detail of Christ's 
birth and Christ's life and Christ's death was referenced in the Old Testament. Every detail, even as he brings the firstborn into the world. Well, that can only be understood as his birth in Bethlehem. There's no other way to, uh, to understand that. And he, even as he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and he quotes from the Old Testament, and let all the angels of God worship him. And in the Greek language, when you look at that passage about the angels filling the sky, it, it, it comes across as, as a little bit of a jumble and a little bit chaotic, that there's just this mass of angels there. And, and what are they saying? Glory to God in the highest. Let all the angels of God worship him, the firstborn. Glory to God in the highest. God took on our humanity. God was born miraculously of Mary in Bethlehem. God was born as King Herod. Uh, God took on our humanity as Herod ordered this taxation through the whole ancient world months, maybe even a year or more before. And, and then the whole timing of it gets them to perfectly timed to be in Bethlehem. They weren't reading the Old Testament and saying, well, I guess we got to go to Bethlehem now. They were listening to this taxation thing that was happening, and they were going, oh, you've got to be kidding. Mary, you're going to give birth any time now, and we got to go to Bethlehem? Yeah, they weren't going, oh, yeah, it says right there, Micah 5, 2. It wasn't like that. They were just caught up in the, the moment of what was happening in their lives and fulfilling Scripture, and they didn't even know they were until afterwards when everything was made clear that this was what was written. But even the angels appearing when God brought his firstborn into the world. And you know, there's another aspect of the firstborn that we didn't even talk about or reference last week. But if you remember the plagues of Egypt, and you remember the final plague, the firstborn child would die for the sin of that family. And the firstborn of Israel was redeemed by the blood. The firstborn became the priest of the home until the Levitical priesthood took effect. And so when he says, I bring my firstborn into this world, it's not only about first in position. It's not about the first who would be risen from the dead. But the firstborn was the one who bore this penalty of sin for the entire family. And I'm so glad, you know, as I told these Nepali people yesterday, you know, that Christ was born to die on a cross, to forgive us of our sins, to be the one who bore the wrath of God against the wrongs that I have done and you have done. And so when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And it's just like they, they couldn't help themselves. They had to see God, who had always existed long before their creation, he never had a beginning, never had an end, took on our humanity, became helplessly dependent upon Joseph and Mary, had to have his diaper changed. It's like the angels are like, we got to see this, you know? we got to see it. Peter said angels long to look into these things. As, as the prophets prophesied in the Old Testament, the person and the work of Christ who would become. They sought to know who was it? Who are we describing? Who are we talking about? Who is this Christ? And the angels themselves longed to look into it. They longed so much that when those shepherds were in the field and the announcement was made, they filled the sky. And it was pre-written that they would. This should give us such confidence that God's at work in our lives, too. To see the care that he put into the birth of his son and just all the details that were covered. 
The writer of Hebrews goes on to say, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. He's born a king. He has an eternal throne. He's God. He, he, there's never a time he hasn't reigned, and there's never will be a time he doesn't rule. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. I just want to tell you, pandemic doesn't rule. It may be a mess, it may be a terrible thing, but there's only one on the throne, and that's God. And of the Son, he, again, he quotes these passages from the Old Testament, and he says, of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And I'm so thankful, you know. Uh, we learned so much when we heard about our daughter Jennifer's experience with Jesus when she was between life and death, that, that he really does rule because it did not look to our eyes like that was happening. It looked to our eyes the other side of what was happening to her. She was suffering terribly. She was deathly sick and was expected to die. That's all that our eyes could see. Our faith reached out to God, and we rejoiced in the small progresses that we were told about, about the blood gases. Those were the things you know, I would put on Facebook. There are measurable improvements. Well, the improvements were small increases in her blood gases. Who knows what that even is? You know, I have no idea what it is. You know, uh, I would rather have an improvement like she's off the respirator you know, which she is now, but, uh, you know. But in the midst of all that, Jesus was on his throne. If only we would trust him more fully and more completely. No. And so, in Luke chapter 2, verse 35 we're going to talk a little bit here. We still haven't gotten to uh, born a king really yet. But Luke chapter 2, verse 35, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. He was looking for the Messiah. The Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, he took him into his arms, blessed God, and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. He's holding a baby in his hands. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. In fairness to Simeon, he, he knew generally when the parents would be bringing the baby into the temple because no doubt as one who longed for the Messiah, he had heard what the shepherds had said, the announcement that had been made. And he knew there was roughly 50 days and that baby would have to be coming into the temple. And, and he was alert. He was looking for it. But the Holy Spirit was upon him. And when they brought the baby Jesus in, it clicked. That's him. That's the one. And he goes over and he picks up this little baby who can't talk or can't do anything. And he says, my eyes have seen your salvation and the glory of your people Israel. That cloud of glory is, is in the fabric of this little baby that he's holding in his hands. A light of revelation to the Gentiles. Aren't you thankful? Because we're all Gentiles. <laughs> Aren't we? Yeah. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and in the fabric of this child is the glory of God. 
Jesus is so unique. So not much is actually said that the Bible gives us reference to from Simeon and Anna until the wise men come. So if you remember, one of the last things that was said was this child would be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. So who are the next people in this narrative? They're Gentiles. Matthew 2, verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi arrived from the east, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So the next people who come are Gentiles, and they come from the east. Uh, we don't know exactly what that means. There, there are different ideas, and some of them are, are better than others. But what we do know is they had an experience where they saw something in the heavens that let them know a king had been born. Not someone who would become a king, like Prince Charles, maybe, you know. Is the queen still the queen? <laughs> okay, she hasn't retired at this point. <laughs> She's hanging in there. Uh, not someone who would become a king, but someone who would be born a king. Something in his nature that from all eternity he had already ruled. And so we don't know, you know, for sure who the, these wise men were. Uh, a lot of speculation that back in the days when Daniel was taken captive in Babylon and he had been promoted to be the ruler over a group that was called the wise men, that possibly the prophecies that he gave about Christ had been kept alive in that group of people. Uh, we don't know that for sure, but that is likely one way that they would be familiar with a king coming out of Israel. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, going to share a little bit about that. He writes, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will be le not left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, and it itself will endure forever. And as much as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future." And so the dream is true. Its interpretation is trustworthy. Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, did homage to Daniel, gave orders to present him an offering and fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of lords and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. It's possible that their knowledge of a savior, of a king, went back to those days. And this vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, this dream of this four-metaled image in which a stone cut without hands would come hurtling in and hit it at the feet, was actually a picture of the four great kingdoms of the world from that time on. It was Babylon, followed by the Medes and the Persians, and, and uh, that was followed by the Greeks, and then it was followed by Rome, and Rome was the feet of, 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 of iron, just trampled the whole earth and conquered all the known world at that time. And this stone cut without hands, uh, which is a, a, a picture of the virgin birth of Christ, a human father was not involved. This stone was cut without human hands and came hurtling into the world and hit this image at the time of the Roman Empire, the feet of iron and clay 
and became a great mountain, displaced all the nations of the world and became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Do you know Jesus actually referenced that as himself? In Matthew 21, uh, verse 42, Jesus said to them, did you never read the scriptures, the the stone which the builders rejected? This has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people, producing the fruit of it. And And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. He's speaking about two different prophecies from the Old Testament, and he's bringing them together, and he says, I am that stone that if you fall on me, you will be broken, but if I fall on you, this stone cut without hands that comes in the time of the Roman Empire, enters the world, becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. And you know what? Uh, where Sundar and Lydia and Sam and Sheba live is half the world away. Pretty much, isn't it? And you have family and friends there who love Jesus and are worshiping him today. And half the world away, we're here, I mean, this stone, this one who came cut without human hands, sent by the Father in a miraculous way, entering the human race and the world, displacing the nations of the earth for a kingdom that will never end. It doesn't mean that there aren't earthly kingdoms, but there's only one kingdom that will never end, and it's his, and he is the king. And he said, if this stone falls on you, you'll be Ground to powder and dust, just like Daniel's vision said. He claimed to be that. And he claimed to be the stone that the builders rejected because he was. Do you know a couple of verses after that? That's where that song, This is the Day, comes from, by the way. This is the day that the Lord has made. What day? Bind the sacrifice to the altar, the day of his death. I mean, he makes every day, but there's a specific day that he made. This is the day. Bind the sacrifice to the altar. Born a king. Isaiah chapter 7, 14. All of you know this. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. She will call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, 6, for a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty, God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Yes, this one who was born after the fashion of other births, not conceived after the fashion of other conceptions, but born after the fashion of other births, has always existed as God, mighty God. It's the story of the farmer who, up in New York State, his wife was at church on Christmas Eve, and he wasn't a believer. It was terribly cold, and he was worried about some of the animals, the birds. He loved the birds, and he was worried that they might freeze to death, and then he started thinking, you know, how, how can I get them into my barn? So he went out, and he shouted at them, hey! Ran at them to try to drive them towards the barn. They just, they had no clue what he was doing, you know? Flew everywhere. Maybe if I turn on the light. He turned on the light. Didn't, nothing happened. They didn't get the idea. And as he worried about it and thought, how could I tell them about the danger that they face? It hit him. The only way is if I could become a bird and explain to them in bird. <laughs> how to avoid the danger that, will, that might take their life. It hit him. That is Christianity. That is Christmas. That is the incarnation. God in heaven tried to explain through prophets and prophets and all kinds of other things. 
uh, uh, but, but no one really got it. So he came in the person of his son. He said, I'm going to go myself, and I'm going to make a place of safety for them. I'm going to tell them where that place of safety is, and that place of safety is the cross. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 11. When we lived in England, uh, we were out on the street a lot doing street witnessing, and, and we met a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses out there. We met a lot of Mormons. And I used to have Bible studies with the Jehovah's Witnesses explaining to them Philippians chapter 2, 6. And some of them, uh, I remember saying to me, I wish we'd have met you before we became Jehovah's Witnesses. But I had to take them to this passage, who although he existed in the form of God, Christ existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Eternally, he had been the, the center of heaven's worship and adoration as God the Son. He existed in the form of God, but he did not regard that equality, which was real, a thing to be grasped a hold of. When it came time for him to leave heaven and take on our humanity, to humble himself. Do you know Jesus is the name of his humiliation? Lord is the name of his exaltation. Taking on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of man, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, we live in the day where we can willingly confess that he is Lord. We can willingly surrender our lives to him. We, we can uh, give him control of our lives uh, and not just say he is Lord, but live like he is Lord. Make him the Lord of our lives. One day, every knee will bow, but it won't be in the same way that ours does now. It will be a forcible subject, and it will be too late. We live in the day where freely we bow the knee, we confess that he is Lord. God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And that's what we have to keep in mind. Whatever the pressure that comes upon us in this life is in the form of a pandemic, whether the pressure that comes upon us uh, in this life is the form of a disease, whether the pressure that comes upon us in this life is financial instability. No matter what the pressure is that comes on us in this life, I want to tell you there's a name that is above every other name. Every other name. And he is Lord. Charlene and I had some of the most amazing experiences when we were living by faith. And we didn't have a, a, a a regular income. People thought we were crazy. You know, we not only worked for a group that didn't pay you, but you had to pay them to work for them. Sundar, is that your job description? <laughs> You're going to pay them to work for them? Where you work? Any of you? You know, I mean, you have to be radical to be in youth with the mission. I'll put it that way. You have to be a radical. But I saw the Lord multiply money in my wallet. I saw him put groceries in our food pantry that weren't there. We, we saw him move on people to leave groceries at our door that would be exactly what we would have chosen to buy if we had. We got money in the mail when we needed it, and, and we didn't even, at that point, like have newsletters, and we weren't telling people. You know, We just were listening to what the Bible said, go into your closet and close the door and pray, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I mean, that's, that's the way we were living. We gave away so much of what came in because we saw the needs around us and, and were able to help other people as well. There's a name that is above every name. 
It's above the name of poverty. It's above the name of sickness. It's above the name of COVID-19. It's above the name of worry. It's above the name of fear. It's above the name of not knowing the future. It's a name that is above every name. And when we allow ourselves to enjoy the reality of that, you know, and our confidence in God brings us to a point where we know that that is true, we're blessed. We have a peace that passes understanding, that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So yeah, bring your petitions, make your prayers, all all those things are great. But know that the one who was born, the one who by the Holy Spirit is still here, that one who ruled at his birth because by nature he is God, is in your life. You are blessed. You are privileged. You you have something that's real in your life that people who don't know the Lord don't have. You have a confidence about life that whatever comes your way, it's going to work out. He's going to do something. He's working in the circumstance. He's working in the situation. So you, you have a confidence in that. He knows your name. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Like Jennifer, you may be almost dead. And Jesus appears to you. I told her, you know, when when she's ready to share more, you know, we're ready to hear more. (laughs) But that's that's her call. You know, that's her call. But the little bit that she has shared with us. She had a whole different perspective than we had during that time. (laughs) I could ask Ed and the team to come back up. This one, this Christ, this... I didn't even get to my message. (laughs) Well, I guess there's next week. <laughs> He's here for you. Like I told my Nepali friends yesterday, just reading the account of his birth, and they came up with, I'm afraid I'm going to go to hell. That must have been working in them for a while. The truth is, that's why he came. We owed a debt we couldn't pay. He paid a price he didn't know. We're so blessed. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. And that's why the devil has tried to take the focus off of Jesus because he doesn't want people thinking about that. I'm not opposed. We have a tree and we give gifts and we have eat together and we shop, you know, all those things, mostly online right now. It's not like we don't enjoy that process, but far of far more importance than all of that far more importance than all of that. Christ came to save sinners.